He's one of the best in the business, national NBA writer with the Washington Post and the pride of Beaverton High. Welcome back to the show, Ben Golliver. Ben, how you doing, man? Oh, I'm doing great. Shout out to the Beavers. How's Let, it going, man? Let's go. All right, Ben. Well, the question everyone in Rip City wants to know is, what should the Portland Trailblazers do with the third overall pick? Look, look back at history. It'll tell you everything you need to know. This is a draft and develop franchise. The best players in Portland Trailblazers history are guys they picked. Bill Walton, Clyde Trexler, Brandon Roy, Damian Lillard. The list goes on. I say with the number three pick, the best pick they've had since the Greg Oden draft, you've got to make a selection. You've got to pick. You've got to do what's in the best interest of the franchise. Even if the franchise guard, Damian Lillard, says, hey, maybe go trade for some help for me, you've got a real chance to add a player who could carry a full era, just like some of those guys who I mentioned previously. Uh, to me, it's it's such an enticing opportunity. It's, it might not be number one with Victor Wembanyama, the player who's been hyped you know, completely around the world for the last year, but you're still going to get an excellent high-level player, a difference maker, a franchise changer with that number three pick. And to me, if you're the Portland Trailblazers, you don't fall victim to all the rumors about trades. You don't look for the quick fix. You don't try to uh, you know, trade for a veteran who can maybe help Damian Lillard right now. Instead, you do what's best for the franchise, which is to take a longer view, a more patient view. You do your due diligence. You hold all the workouts. You do the interviews. And you select the best player available with that number three pick. Ben, what would a best case scenario look like for a trade? Well, Portland's been very active, according to a lot of different reports, and I think that they're looking to target holes that they've had probably in the front line and on the wings. I mean, you're hearing a lot of interesting rumors. Is it Pascal Siakam? Is it Zion Williams? You know, could Carly at the Towns be available? Uh, usually, uh, in this kind of a scenario, a top draft pick isn't necessarily going to get traded for a star-level player, but it, that could be a little bit different this time around. The reason why I say that is the new collective bargaining agreement is about to kick in in the NBA, and it's going to really flatten the talent across the league. It's going to be more and more difficult for teams to try to build a super team with three or four stars, and instead it's going to really create this model where a lot of teams are going to have two high-salary players, two star-level guys, and then a whole bunch of role players. And for Portland, when they're looking at their roster with Damian Lillard, they've only got one star. They need to go find that second star. And there's other teams out there, whether it's the Minnesota Timberwolves and New Orleans Pelicans and, and other teams that maybe have uh, three or four big salaries that they're going to need to spread out and, and to uh, you know downgrade a little bit. So there's going to be some opportunities, I think, to, to explore trades for the Blazers, but I'm dead set stuck on it. I think you use this pick. You want to have a great value in a young player who you're bringing in on a very cheap contract for the four, first four years of that rookie deal. And then you can re-sign that player if he hits to the next five years. All of a sudden, you've got yourself a nine-year window with a top young prospect with that number three pick. To me, that's just too good to pass up. All right, Ben, you've had a chance to see many of the top prospects in action. Let's talk about a couple of them. You mentioned Scoot Henderson. What can you tell us about him? Well, he's a big physical point guard. Yeah, He gets compared to a young Derrick Rose or a young Russell Westbrook from an athleticism standpoint. You really feel this guy on the ball. Uh, he's not undersized by any stretch. He's got great leaping ability, great power off the dribble, a very silky handle. He's going to be a fun guy to watch play in the NBA. And on top of all that, he has a very high basketball intelligence. He's great at running the show in the half court. You put him in the pick and roll, you tell him to drive towards the basket and find his shooters. He's going to be able to do that very reliably and with really good decisions. He's an impressive kid off the court. He didn't even want to finish high school. He wanted to go straight and play in the pros. And that, that, hit that path for him was the G League Ignite, a developmental program the NBA has set up for kind of prodigy type players when they're teenagers. He's played there for multiple years. He's given them a lot of tape. You know, scouts have been able to really watch him play against professional quality uh, co competition, and he's really excelled. He actually got a chance to go head to head against Victor Wembanyama, the number one pick in this year's draft, uh, the presumed number one pick, I should say. <laughs> although everybody knows he's going to be the number one pick, and uh, they played in a couple showcase games in Nevada last October. And what was so amazing about Scoot Henderson in those showcase games is he didn't want to give an inch. He didn't want this to just be the the Wembanyama showcase. He wanted to make sure he had his highlights, he had his own moments, where uh, really making the executives who were in attendance 
ooh and ah, and he even tried to dunk on Victor Wembanyama, who's seven foot five. At one point, he tried to just go right over the top of him. So he has that kind of fearlessness, that kind of moxie, that kind of charisma, and of course, all the athletic tools to go along with it. Okay, so if we're talking Scoot Henderson, it seems like Brandon Miller is the other dude that could be available at number three. What do you see out of Brandon Miller? Well, he's right in the same kind of line of players like Paul George or Jason Tatum or Brandon Ingram. You know, long two-way wings who can handle the ball a little bit, who should be good defensive players at the professional level, who can shoot the three-pointer and, and can do a little bit of everything. I think the biggest questions with Brandon Miller, though, it comes down to his character. It comes down to off-court, um, you know, concerns. Obviously, there was a, a shooting and wound up killing a woman in Alabama while he was there. Now, of course, he wasn't the shooter, uh, but there there are reports saying that he brought the gun sort of inadvertently to the crime scene and uh, handed it off to, to someone else who, who used it. I mean, that kind of a situation, is it wrong place, is it wrong time? Those are the kinds of questions you want to explore during pre-draft interviews with him to get a real comfort factor in, in using a high-level pick on uh, Brandon Miller. Now, of course, the backdrop to that decision would be the NBA's John Morant controversy that has really gone on for months here. He was uh, suspended this week for 25 games for his second video where he's flashing a gun. Clearly, the NBA has a very low tolerance uh, towards any kind of conversations around firearms. And you just don't want to be in a situation where your organization is held up because a very promising young player has had some sort of an incident along those lines. So uh, as incredible as he is as a prospect on the court in the shooting ability, like I said, the scoring ability, he was the highest profile player in the entire NCAA season this year, leading an Alabama team that was number one for much of the year because of his play. Uh, you know, there's these other concerns and, and questions that you want to have answered before you can feel comfortable drafting him. So if you're the Portland Trailblazers, you've made it clear if, if Ben Golliver was, was running the show, we're making this pick. So obviously it depends on what the Charlotte Hornets do, but who would you want playing for the Portland Trailblazers if it's between those two players? Well, look, Orlando, the best case scenario is that we're all going to Las Vegas for Summer League and we're watching the, the newly minted Portland Trailblazers guard, Scoot Henderson. Now, I know that could get a little bit complicated because you already have a point guard in Damian Lillard. He's significantly older than Scoot Henderson, but you have to start thinking about the future for this franchise and what comes next. And they've really been stuck in the muck for the last couple of years. They don't really know whether they're coming or going. And you want to have somebody who can eventually be capable of taking the baton from Damian Lillard. I think there's a chance in the short term you could play those two guys together. Uh, they're both very skilled offensive players. You could see scenarios where Scoot Henderson runs the offense and really creates open looks and easy looks for Damian Lillard. You could also see a scenario where Lillard goes to the bench, and that's you know Scoot Henderson's opportunity to, to really run the show. But I think this is more about the long-term future of the organization. You, know, you have questions in ownership. You've got a pretty new front office on both the basketball side and the business side. This is an opportunity to really rebuild, to really retool and set yourself up for the next decade. And I think the surest, uh, you know, fire player who's going to be available at number three or could be available at number three would be Scoot Henderson. I think that's their best case scenario. I don't know if you're hearing anything around the league about the Hornets, especially now with Michael Jordan uh, selling off the majority stake in ownership here. But do you think that would impact what the Hornets do with the second pick? Are you hearing anything about what way they're leaning? Well, I don't want to be too much of a jerk, but the Hornets' track record is they, they make mistakes in the draft, especially when they have top picks. I mean, you go back the last 10 years, it's a really, really ugly draft record. So, uh, you know, I don't know if it's Michael making the pick or somebody else making the pick. I mean, uh, regardless, you know, history has not smiled kindly on that franchise when it comes to these big decisions. Now, uh, they have LaMelo Ball, who's a pretty young point guard already in place. And I think the question becomes... Do they like Scoot Henderson enough that they're willing to take a chance and kind of have two young point guards who are both going to be battling for control of the basketball a little bit? Uh, I think if you bring in Brandon Miller, if you're the Hornets as the number two pick, uh, he's a more natural complement to LaMelo Ball. The Hornets had an issue with one of their players, Miles Bridges, last year getting into some legal problems off the court. He wasn't on the team anymore. He was a very athletic forward, kind of known for uh, high, high finishes around the basket area on passes from LaMelo. Once they took away that supporting piece from LaMelo Ball, he was a lot less effective as a player. And you could uh, you know, envision a scenario where a player like Brandon Miller steps into that hole that Bridges played last year, and they're really off and running. 
the Hornets want to play this up-tempo style, and I think the more athleticism and length that they can add around the mellow, the better. And I think if I was in their position, that actually might make me lean uh, towards Brandon Miller rather than Scoot Henderson just because he'd be a cleaner fit and a better fit. But there's also been a lot of chatter that maybe they would want to trade this pick uh, maybe for a, you know, a faster, you know, quicker fix because they've really had a, a team that's struggled here over these last couple of years. We'll see if they're able to remain patient. We'll see if the Portland Trailblazers can remain patient because sometimes you get tempted with these scenarios of trying to trade these picks off for players who can help you right now. Ben, I'll get you out of here on this one. I wanted to ask you about what draft night is like. You've had a chance to cover the league nationally now for a few years now, and I'm wondering what Thursday the 22nd is going to be like. Well, Orlando, it's not just draft night, it's draft week. You know, I'm flying to New York on Sunday. I can't wait. I'm that excited for what's going to be Wemby Mania. This is going to be one of the most interesting drafts, one of the most hyped drafts of the last 20 years. To me, he's the best prospect since LeBron James. It's probably going to be the most hyped and talked about draft since that 2003 class that had LeBron James and Dwayne Wade and Chris Bosh. And when you get there in New York, obviously, it's a lot of pomp and circumstance. They hold it at the Barclays Center in brooklyn which is a pretty new arena they like to do a red carpet for the players to come out and show off their custom suits and their custom jackets and their custom sneakers a lot of time and the jewelry and all that kind of stuff and then it gets to be a very very tense and and anxious moment as all these players sit there at these tables with their loved ones their family members their agents sometimes their former coaches and just wait to hear their name called and, of course, you get the, the big sigh of relief moment that everybody watches on television, right? When they call your name, you get to go up there and shake Adam Silver's hand. It, for a lot of people, it's a lifelong journey to get to that point. And uh, I expect a lot of tears on Thursday night. I expect a lot of excitement, especially for the San Antonio Spurs fans, adding Victor Wembanyama. And I expect some trades and, and some chaos as well. You know, There's been a lot of rumors the last week, so I think it's going to be a fun time all around. Oh, I'm so excited. Thank you so much, Ben, for getting us caught up on all things NBA, especially involving the Portland Trailblazers. He is the national NBA writer with the Washington Post and, of course, the pride of Beaverton High School. Ben, thanks for rocking with us here on Sports Sunday. Oh, my pleasure, man. Take care.